Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. Watch us this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus, walking in the Spirit, and opposing the things of the flesh. Well, we're continuing our review in the book, Love Not the World by Watchman Nee. And today we're going to pick up in chapter seven, which is titled Detachment. Now we have seen the church as a thorn in Satan's side, causing him acute discomfort and reducing his freedom of movement. Though in the world, the church not only refuses to aid the world's construction, but persist in pronouncing judgment upon it. But if this is true, if the church is always a source of irritation to the world, then equally the world is a source of constant grief to the church. And because the world is always developing and progressing, its power to distress God's people is ever expanding. In fact, the church has to meet a force in the world today with which in the early days she was not confronted at all. Now I want to pause there and just reread that, but I want you to think about where we are in the world today with all the technology and how different that is from, let's say, 2,000 years ago when the early disciples, the early followers of Jesus were just coming together to create this new bond, this new fellowship that walks according to the teachings of Jesus. So Watchman Nee says, the church has to meet a force in the world today with which in the early days she was not confronted at all. Then the children of God met open persecution in the shape of outward physical assault upon their persons. Now you can read about this in Acts chapter 12 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. They were always coming into collision with material, tangible things. The chief trouble these early followers met in the world was more subtle, an intangible force behind its material things that is not holy, but spiritually evil. The impact of that spiritual force is far greater than it was then. And not only is it greater, there is an element present now that was not there formally. In Revelation chapter 9, we read of a development which, to the author of that book, lay far in the future, when he said, The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven fallen unto the earth. And there was given to him the key of the pit of the abyss. And he opened the pit of that abyss. And there went up a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And out of the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth. And power was given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was said unto them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree but only such men as have not the seal of God on their foreheads. Now this is figurative language, but the star falling from heaven obviously refers to Satan. And we know that the bottomless pit is his domain, his storehouse, we might say. Thus it appears that the end time is to be marked by a special release of his forces and men will find themselves up against a spiritual power with which they previously did not have to contend. Surely this accords with conditions in our day. While it is true that sin and violence will be greater than ever at the close of this age, it is apparent from God's word that it is not specifically these with which the church will have to grapple then but with the spiritual appeal of far more everyday things. As it came to pass in the days of Noah, we are told from Holy Scripture, even so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. You see, they ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. 
and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, even as it came to pass in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But in the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. You'll read these words of Jesus in Luke chapter 17, verses 26 through 29. Now the point being made here by Jesus is not that these things, food, marriage, trade, agriculture, engineering, it's not that these things were outstanding characteristics of Lot's and Noah's days, but they, they will be in a special way, they will characterize the last days. Jesus said again, after the same manner shall it be in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. That is the point. For these things are not inherently sinful. They are simply things of the world. Have you ever in all your days paid such attention to the good life as now? Food and raiment are becoming the special burden of God's children today. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For many, these are almost the sole topics of conversation. There is a power that forces you to consider these matters. Your very existence demands that you pay attention to them. And yet scripture warns us that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness. It bids us to first of all seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it assures us that as we do so, all these things will be added to us. It bids us to be carefree regarding matters of food and clothing. For if God cares for the flowers of the field and the birds of the air, will he not much rather care for us, his own? Yet to judge by our anxieties, it would almost seem that they are cared for, but not we. Now here is the point that needs emphasis. This condition of things is abnormal. The undue attention to eating and drinking, whether at the extreme of subsistence or of luxury, that characterizes so many Christians these days is far from normal. It is supernatural. For it is not just a question of food and drink that we are meeting here. We are meeting demons. Satan conceived and now controls the world order, and he is prepared to use demonic power through the things of the world to lure us into the world. The present state of affairs cannot be accounted for apart from this. Oh, friends, that the children of God might awaken to this fact. In past days, God's saints met all sorts of difficulties, Yet, in the midst of pressure, they could look up and trust God. In the pressures of today, however, they are so confused and bewildered that they seem unable to trust Him. Oh, let us realize the satanic origin of all this pressure and confusion. The same is true in matrimonial affairs. Never have we met so many problems in this field as today. There is confusion abroad as young people break with old traditions, but they lack the guidance of any new ones to replace them. This fact is not to be accounted for naturally, but supernaturally. Marrying and given in marriage are wholesome and normal in any age, but today there is an element breaking into these things that is unnatural. So it is with planting and building and so too with buying and selling. All these things can be perfectly legitimate and beneficial, but today the power behind them presses upon men until they are bewildered and they lose their balance. The evil force that energizes the world system has precipitated a condition today where we see two extremes the one extreme of utter inability to make ends meet, and the other extreme of unusual opportunity to amass wealth. On the one hand, 
many Christians find themselves in unprecedented economic difficulties. On the other hand, many are faced with no less unprecedented opportunities of enriching themselves. Both of these conditions are abnormal. Enter into any home these days and listen in on the conversation. You will hear remarks such as these. Last week, I bought such and such goods at such and such a figure, and I have thereby saved so much. Or, happily, I purchased that a year ago. Otherwise, I would have lost badly. Or, if you want to sell, sell now while the market is good. Have you not noticed the way people are rushing here and there, feverishly making business deals? Doctors are stocking up with flour. Cloth manufacturers are selling paper. Men and women who have never touched such things before are being swept off their feet by the current of speculation. They are caught up in a marketing maelstrom that is whirling them madly around. Do you not realize that this state of affairs is not natural? Do you not see that there is a power here which is captivating men? People are not acting sanely. They are beside themselves. Today's buying and selling spree is not just a question of making a little money or losing it. It is a question of touching a satanic system. We are living in the end time, a time when a special power has been let loose which is driving men on, whether they will or not. So the question today is not so much one of sinfulness as of worldliness. Who would dare say to you, you do wrong to eat and drink? Who would dare to disapprove of marrying and given in marriage? Who would question your right to buy and to sell? These things are not in themselves wrong. The wrong lies in the spiritual force behind them, which, through their medium, presses relentlessly upon us. Oh, that we might awake to the fact that whereas these things are so common and so simple, they are yet being used by Satan to ensnare God's children into the great net of his world order. Jesus told us in Luke 21, 34, Take heed to yourselves, lest haply your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you suddenly as a snare. Note the term life in Jesus' words. In the Greek New Testament, three words are commonly used for life. Zoe, which is spiritual life, suki, which is psychological life, and bios, which is biological life. The last is the word used here appearing in adjective form, biotikase, or of this life. The Lord is warning us to beware lest we be unduly pressured with this life's care. That is to say, with anxieties regarding quite ordinary matters, such as food and dress, which belong to our present existence on the earth. It was over just such a simple thing that Adam and Eve fell. And it will be due to just such simple matters that some Christians may overlook the heavenward call of God. For it is always a matter of where the heart is. We are exhorted not to let our hearts be overcharged or laden with these things to our loss. That is to say we are not to carry a burden regarding them that would weigh us down. We are to be in a true sense detached in spirit from our goods in the house or in the field. Let us realize who we are. We are the church, the light of the world shining amid the darkness. As such, let us live our lives down here. There was a time when the church rejected the world's ways. Now she not only uses them, she abuses them. Of course, we must use the world because we need it. But let us not want it. Let us not desire it. 
So Jesus continues, Watch ye at every season, making supplication that you may prevail to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand, or literally be set before the Son of Man. Again, Luke 21, 36. Would God urge us to watch and pray were there not a spiritual force to guard against? We dare not take our destiny as a matter of course, but we must be constantly on the alert that we be truly disentangled in spirit from the elements of this world. There are things of the world that are essential to our very existence. To be concerned with them is legitimate, but to be weighed down by them is illegitimate and may cause us to forfeit God's best. The book of Revelation suggests that Satan will set up his kingdom of Antichrist in the political world, Revelation 13, in the religious world, Revelation 17, and in the commercial world, Revelation 18. On this threefold basis of politics, religion, and commerce, his reign will find its last violent expression. In the latter two chapters, this kingdom appears under the figure of Babylon, the special instrument of Satan. Babylon seems to represent corrupted Christianity, Rome perhaps, but bigger and more insidious than Rome, and it is on the ground of her commerce that she is judged. The whole record of Revelation 18 revolves around merchants and merchandise, those who bemoan the great city's fall from the king right down to the ship's helmsman all bewail the thought that her flourishing trade has suddenly ceased. Evidently, it is neither religion nor politics, but trade that causes the spirit of Babylon to flourish again, and that is bewailed in her downfall. We dare not emphatically state that pure commerce is wrong, but this we do say on the ground of God's holy word, that its beginning is connected with Satan and its end with Babylon. You'll find this in Ezekiel 28 and Revelation 18. And this we add from hard-earned experience, that commerce is the field in which more than in any other the corruption that is in the world through lust relentlessly pursues even the most high principled of Christians and apart from the grace of God will all too easily overtake them to their undoing. Are we sensitive to Babylon? The merchants wept, but heaven cried hallelujah. You'll find this in Revelation 19.1. These found in Revelation 19, 1 through 6, are the only hallelujahs recorded here in the New Testament. Do we re-echo them? Yes, we are in a perilous realm when which we touch commerce. If by reason of our calling we engage in pure trade, and if we do so in fear and trembling, we may with God's help escape the snare of the devil. But if we are overconfident, then there is no hope of escape from the unscrupulous self-seeking that such business engenders. So the problem that confronts us these days is not how to refrain from buying and selling, from eating and drinking, from marrying and being given in marriage. The problem now is to avoid the power behind these things. For we dare not let that power triumph over us. What then is the secret of holding our material things in the will of God? Surely it is to hold them for God. That is to say, to know we are not hoarding useless valuables or amassing vast bank deposits. But instead we are laying up treasures to his account. You and I must be perfectly willing to part with anything at any moment. It matters not whether I leave $2,000 or merely two. What matters is whether I can leave whatever I have, 
without a twinge of regret. Let me reread that because, friends, that is the secret. We must, as the children of God, be perfectly willing at any moment to part with anything that we own. What matters is whether we can leave whatever we have without a twinge of regret. And unfortunately for so many of us, that is untrue. But that is the place, friends, where we must bring ourselves in our relationship with God and in our hearts that nothing has a hold on us and we can, without any regret, dispose of anything that we have at any given moment. I am not suggesting by this, says Watchman Nee, that we must try to dispose of everything. That is not the point. The point is that as God's children, you and I may not accumulate things for ourselves. If we keep something, it is because God has spoken to our hearts. If we part with it, it is for the same reason. We are to hold ourselves in the will of God and be not afraid to give if God asks us to give. We keep nothing because we love it, but instead we let it go without regret when the call comes to leave it behind. This is what it means to be truly detached from this world in which we live. And that brings us to the close of chapter 7 today, friends. And I trust that through this chapter, you have been reminded, as Jesus so warned us of, to be cautious and aware of the dangers, the deceptiveness, and the lure that this world has upon us as the people of God, and that you fight with all your power to resist the things of this world. And you bring your heart to a true place of surrender before the God whom you serve. Not just in spirit, soul, and body, but in how you spend your time, how you spend your strength, and how you spend your money. For truly, as his people, we know all good things come from our Father above. And yet they are only being lent to us so that we will use them for his glory, his honor, and his service. Well, friends, I truly love you. I'm so thankful that you're again with us through another portion, another opportunity to learn what it means to be a true follower of the Lord Jesus. And I pray that your journey will be blessed until we meet again. Now, as he wills, and until we do meet again, may the Lord Jesus keep you and may you truly walk according to his spirit every moment of your life, not according to the flesh. I love you. You are in my thoughts and prayers, and I will see you on the next video.